Good evening and welcome to our webinar, How the Environment Affects Your Health and Why Green Spaces Are So Important. Um, tonight's speaker is Dr. Aruni Bhatnagar. Um, I will introduce him in a few minutes. Uh, but my name is Jim Waltman. I'm the Executive Director of the Watershed Institute. My pronouns are he and him. Um, we'd like to start this evening with an acknowledgement we recognize that the land and water now under our care at the Watershed Institute is the traditional and ancestral territory of the Leni Lenape. We pay respect to Lenape people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. Keeping water clean, safe, and healthy is at the heart of the Watershed Institute's mission. And this is a very important topic tonight and very much aligned with our mission. So we're extremely pleased to be co-sponsoring this program um, and particularly pleased to be doing so um, in coalition with our three partners, the East Trenton Collaborative, IELTS, and the Trenton Health Team are co-sponsoring this webinar. And we're very glad to have these important community groups here as part of the conversation um, I'm going to start uh, tonight off with just a few words for each of them, from each of them. Um, first, we'll hear from Gregory Paulson. Uh, Greg is the executive director of the Trenton Health Team. Um, he's going to then hand it off to Elise Pivnik, who's the senior director of environmental health at IELTS. And finally, we'll hear from Caitlin Fair, who's the program director at the East Trenton Collaborative, um, before I introduce tonight's speaker. So um, handing off to you, Greg, thanks for being with us tonight. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to get to partner with the Watershed Institute and, and our other partners on, on this project. Uh, Trenton Health Team's uh, origins were about 15 years ago as healthcare delivery tried to encompass a broader view of what health and well-being mean. And uh, we've been at that for 15 years now and really working to mobilize all the resources within the, the broader Trenton community to understand what it takes to help a community truly achieve the broad definition of health and well-being. Uh, so very much uh, the, the presentation this evening is very much uh, kind of in, in scope for us and we're really pleased to be here. So thanks, Jim, for the invitation. And uh, to my dear friend and close partner, Elise. Oh. Um, whoops, hold on. Did I lose you? Can you hear me? We're just seeing your screen, Elise. All right, I don't know what happened here. There you go. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? All right, so on behalf of IELTS, I'm very happy to welcome you to this conference. IELTS typically focuses on services and policies related to the built environment. This evening, we are pleased to join hands with organizations that historically focus on the natural environment like the Watershed Institute. Of course, it's all one environment, whether we are removing lead from housing or protecting land and water to promote a healthy living environment. I'm sure the session this evening will further illuminate this. So on to my colleague, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Elise. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Caitlin Fair. I'm the program director for the East Trenton Collaborative. Uh, ETC is a community organizing initiative uh, focused on the East Trenton neighborhood, which is a historic neighborhood in the North Ward of the city of Trenton. Um, it is also a very environmentally challenged neighborhood. Um, we do a number of different things through ETC. Um, we have several resident-led committees that focus on a number of different issues that our particular neighborhood faces, uh, one of which is our Environmental Safety Community Organizing uh, Committee. Um, and we have been fortunate to partner with the Watershed Institute on a number of different initiatives um, within the neighborhood. Um, to continue to try to uh, raise awareness about the various different environmental justice concerns that face um, our nation, our world, um, but also particularly in our specific neighborhood um, and other neighborhoods like ours in the city of Trenton. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to also be a part of this particular conference um, to talk more about, uh, you know, these various different issues that um, significantly impact the community that I live in, 
um, that our residents live in um, and how we can continue to be responsible stewards of our environment. So I'm really grateful for all of you for being here um, and excited to uh, hear the presentation this evening. Well, thank you um, one and all for the work that you do. It's so important. And thanks for your collaboration on tonight's event. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Patnagar, but first um, let me just note uh, if, if you have questions for the speaker, please use the, the Q&A function. You can reach that just by scrolling at the bottom. Um, I'll leave it to him whether he wants to wait till the end and answer uh, the questions or um, if there's a particularly timely one during his talk, I'll let him decide whether to jump in or not. Um, widely recognized for spearheading the new field of environmental cardiology, Dr. Botniger, the Smith and Lucille Gibson Professor of Medicine at the University of Louisville, has spent more than 25 years studying the impact of toxic substances, tobacco smoke constituents, and environmental pollutants on heart disease. He leads the Christina Lee Brown Environmental Institute at the University of Louisville that is made up of an uh, integrative group of physicians, scientists, engineers, epidemiologists, economists, psychologists, statisticians, sociologists, and community members working to turn scientific discovery into actionable knowledge. Um, I think you just about have all the bases covered there, sir, with that um, very impressive and comprehensive group of specialists in your team. Um, together, they work to learn the effects um, on, uh, on health um, of environmental matters, increase understanding of environmental health risks, engage communities in bi-directional knowledge sharing, uh, study how differences in urban environments give rise to health disparities, investigating how changes in environments affect health outcomes and disease risk, develop new models for healthy urban living. Um, at, the, at the Watershed Institute, we certainly recognize um, tremendous disparities between um, urban areas um, with pockets of poverty and wealthier neighborhoods that are typically more uh, Caucasian in their demographic makeup. Um, just looking at things like tree cover and susceptibility to flooding, um, two issues that are very um, important to us. We see um, dramatic differentials between um, these different kinds of communities. I, that's a real, um, a, a, a terrible phenomenon that's been persisted for, for decades and um, it is very much the result of policies over years that have discriminated between communities. So we're, we're thrilled to have you with us tonight, um, Dr. Bhatnajar, um, to give this very important speech. And let me just uh, turn it over to you. And um, thank you so very much for being with us this evening. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I'm particularly happy to be speaking to the Watershed Institute. The work that you do is so important and critical. And I wish we had more organizations like that to be able to address environmental concerns and to be recognized that environment could be uh, not only a source of disease, but also a source of health, that we need healthy environments for to survive. So what I wanted to do is to start off with sharing my screen, and let me see if I can do that. Can you see my screen now? Yes, looks good. Okay. So what I thought I would do today is to talk to you about the relationship between nature and cardiovascular health. I want to give you just a little overview on how we think the, in, the environment is important for our health and then tell you about uh, somewhat of a unique, uh, if a difficult experiment that we're doing here in Louisville, it's called the Green Heart Project. So as we all know that heart disease is the leading cause of death worldwide, and it has been um, so for the last 100 years, except for 1918, and when we had the first Spanish flu, and maybe it's going to exceed, or it were, maybe COVID is going to exceed cardiac deaths, uh, maybe this year or the next. So we will see, but 
it is a major killer. And my interest in, in this field stems from the fact that there has been a lot of understanding about how people get heart disease, how we treat heart disease, but the um, incidence of the disease keeps growing. And these are some of the estimates from the American Heart Association, which suggest that there would be a further increase in the rates of heart disease. So although we can treat heart disease, we can put stents, we can give people statins, but we do have an ever-growing increase in the incidence of the disease. And so if treatment is not the only answer, and just diagnosing the disease earlier is not going to curb the disease, but we have to find out ways in which we can prevent the disease altogether. So if you look at, um, um, you know, just not just all of us, but also our uh, immediate cousins, we see that uh, biologically, we are very related to a host of great apes, and but most of them do not develop atherosclerotic disease, or at least the type of atherosclerotic disease that would be um, would, would would be seen in seen in humans. So there must be a, some answer other than sort of a genetic predisposition for the disease that might be able to account for that. So if you look at the genome of a chimp, for example, that we are very very closely related. We are about uh, whatever uh, ninety seven point two percent similar to chimps, and between the human genomes also we have very a low diversity. So it's not particularly our genetic structure, but maybe other sort of uh, explanations for this wide differences in our susceptibility to heart disease. We have in the over the years learned how to read our genome. So we know the actual code that what makes a human being. We know what these individual letters may mean. We understand what the type of um, proteins, these genes encode, but that's actually only half the story. The other piece of the puzzle is the environment. So the genetic program is like a, like a recipe that you would have before you can make, say, a pudding or a pie or a cake. And the recipe has many ways of manifesting itself. It depends upon how the, the code is read how it is implemented and how it is uh, maintained that creates a human being. So in order to understand what a human being is, we don't just need to know the genome of a person, but we also need to know the, the environment that person is in. But it's difficult to understand human environments because in um, comparison with the environments of other uh, species, our environments are actually very complex. The humans exist in large social networks, and these social networks are created by our history and our culture and our biological evolution and our social um, interactions. And so it is a very complex area to study, and there has been limited attempt to understand that uh, as a whole. So one way of looking at it is to maybe uh, develop an analogy to the genome which is that each individual not only has an environment as a genome, but also has an environment. So the, the environment is not your general environment. I mean, there are environments like, you know, you, you, there's environments in, in Greenland and there are environments in Africa. We don't interact with those environments. So the environment that is within our domain, which determines our health, well being, and is the sphere of our action, is the environment. So it could be thought of as a complete set of environmental conditions that affect the fitness and health of a specific individual. So this is in the environment that is unique to which in which an individual exists. Just like the, everybody, all living things have genes, but the genome is an entity of an individual. The environment is a characteristic of a, of a specific person. So why is it so important for us to understand the environment? We think that most chronic diseases arise from the environment by living in unconducive conditions, conditions that do not support our health and well-being, areas that are polluted and areas that are lacking or deficient in our vital needs. We can also um, be diseased because of being in environmental dyssynchrony. We can live 
in, a, in areas or in ways which are not synchronized with the environment. And we talk about that a little bit um, because of a certain level of rhythm that we need to maintain with our environment. And then there may, may be a mismatch between our genes and our environment. We suddenly evolved in a certain set of conditions. Most people believe it's in the African savanna uh, or, and then migrated out from there the modern complex urban environment of skyscrapers and you know rail carriages and airplanes uh, has very little semblance to the world in which our genes were selected and to the environment that we have adapted. So most diseases would arise uh, from uh, environmental influences. Uh, how do we know that? we know that if we change the environment, we can significantly affect the risk of at least the cardiovascular disease. So if we migrate to new environments, the risk of disease changes. For example, these are famous studies from people moving from Hiroshima in Japan to Hawaii in the United States, and they were adopting in an American lifestyle. And we could see that there was over years, a twofold increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease. There could also be a decrease in the risk, and particularly this is a series of studies that came out of Finland is known as the Finnish miracle, in which they uh, could, uh, they had over a 65% decrease in the rates of ischemic heart disease because of change in the national policy. When Finland joined the EU, they could get fresh fruits and vegetables. And so uh, their, their rates of heart disease plummeted. So certainly if there is a disease that could change by you know, a large percent by just changing the environment, we cannot attribute the disease to an individual or to their genetic background. Similarly, if you look at data from China, you see that between 1984 to 1999, the, as China opened up and greater interaction with the West and adaptation of Western diet and Western lifestyle, there was a significant increase in the rates of heart disease in China. So overall, many people have estimated that nearly 60 to 80% of heart disease and diabetes is environmental in origin. And up to 97% of all cancers could be attributable to the environment. So if suddenly uh, it is the environment that, that is driving the disease, that in order for us to understand a chronic disease or in order for us to prevent chronic disease, we must focus on the environment rather than the individual who is in some sense the, uh, is the effector, not, not the cause, but the effect of the disease. So of all the diseases that are caused by the environment, the cardiovascular disease seems to be the leading cause of death. This is data from the WHO showing that individuals uh, who are exposed to adverse environments succumb mostly to cardiovascular disease, uh, then maybe somewhat to intention, unintentional injuries, cancer, respiratory disease, and diarrheal disease. But for some reason, the cardiovascular uh, system seems to be very sensitive to, um, to, uh, or to exposure to adverse environments, which is not to say that cancer is not environmental. Like I mentioned, 97% uh, of cancer, except for say maybe some cases of breast cancer and colon cancer, most cancers, could are sporadic and could be attributed to the environment. So we can think of environment as having sort of specific different domains. So the, uh, these are sort of domains that are nested within each other. There is a natural environment. And out of this, we create a social environment. And out of the social environment, each of us create our own personal environment. And in these personal environments are not really, sometimes are not really by choice, but by circumstance and by accident, but in any case, those are subsets of the environment, of the social environment. And a social environment is, of course, a subset of the natural environment. And so the idea that I want to sort of put across today is that cardiovascular disease is an environmental disease. And in order to, for us to understand it, we need to look at its origins and its modifications by the, by the environment. So, the most primordial and the primary of all environments, of course, is the natural environment. The natural environment is also quite complex, it's made up of many parts. Uh, certainly, uh, it has a geosphere and a biosphere. We are, we live within 
uh, certain geography and the attributes of geography affect our health and well-being, but we also part of this larger biosphere and things like microbes and plants and animals also affect our health and well-being. And we know that quite starkly now with COVID, how important uh, microbes are to our health. And uh, But we are still trying to understand how other plants and animals affect us. So how does the environment regulate our health? So one of the most primordial feature of life on the planet is uh, the diurnal cycle or the circadian rhythms, which means the, um, the daily rhythm of light, light and night and day. And all life is entrained to this cycle. About uh, one third of our genes oscillate in, in synchrony with, with, uh, with light and darkness. Uh, and all animals and plants respond to changes in light and dark. And individuals who actually um, have a misaligned circadian rhythms um, have higher risk of obesity and diabetes and heart disease. And now that we live in this 24 seven world, we have light that we can make our day, our uh, nights and turn into day. We can make our summer, our winters turn into summer. We have uh, difficulty adapting to this new environment. So it means that in order for us to be healthy, we have to pay attention to these cyclical changes, uh, which we have for many, many years evolved to adapt to. But other than just the night and day, we are also sensitive to the rhythms of the season. We know that levels of cholesterol in people is higher in winter. We know that metabolic rates is lower in summer. And then we know that overall cardiovascular mortality is lower in summer. But the surprising part here is, and this is data from Los Angeles, that we can see that the number of heart attacks in Los Angeles are much higher in winter than in summer. And I'm not, if you've been to Los Angeles, you know about it, you know that there is no summer to speak of. And so, and no winter to speak of, it's just one continuous you know, good weather. So uh, what happens is that there may be some other features rather than just temperature that's driving this sort of change in the mortality, uh, which is independent of seasons, which may be in part related to, and we don't know for sure, but maybe in part related to sunlight. We know that sunlight is critically important for health and well being. We are like plants, we under, undergo photosynthesis. We cannot live without adequate exposure to sunlight because we need vitamin D. Uh, to, a, to support a number of functions, in, including immune function, bone health, cardiovascular health, uh, mood, uh, cognition. So all of this we get from uh, vitamin D, which is critically important and dependent upon sunlight exposure. And that is one of the reasons why you see this large diversity in skin colors in humans because of the latitude that they live in would depend upon the sunlight exposure and that would determine the color of their skin. Lighter skin absorbs more sunlight and more UV light than darker skin. And so consequently people who have you know, lived and evolved to live in areas of high uh, latitude would obviously have lighter skins than people who are actually living in more tropical environments. But in addition to, to just uh, creating vitamin D and being involved in vitamin D synthesis, the visible light also entrains our biological clock so that we have this internal clock of about 24 hours um, and some minutes. And so we need constant exposure to sunlight or at least light and dark to be able to realign our circadian rhythms. There is also some evidence that exposure to UV light, a different type of UV light is required for blood pressure regulation. But in addition to sunlight and, um, and other changes UV light exposure that happens with latitude, there is also a gradient of health across the latitudes. For instance, we know that blood pressure increases from the distance from equator. So many studies have shown that people who live near the equator have lower levels of blood pressure than people live in more temperate environments and higher latitudes or lower latitudes, both sides of the globe. Um, and that may have, again, to do something with sunlight, but there may be other reasons. But the point is that there are important elements in a natural environment that make a huge difference on our health, uh, disease risk, uh, longevity, and survival, as well as fitness. We also know that altitude makes a big difference. 
that people who live in higher altitudes generally have lower incidence of heart disease. We've known from several studies that people who live high, in high altitudes, for example, in the higher altitudes in Sweden, uh, Switzerland, that when they move down from, uh, um, from a mountain to low sea level areas, that the benefit conferred by living at high um, uh, elevation is sustained. Children who are born in mountainous areas seem to do better than children who are born at sea level. Uh, again, we do not understand the reason, but uh, it is another example of how our geography uh, regulates and determines our biology. But the most important uh, feature of our natural environment and habitat, uh, and that's what I want to talk to you about for the rest of the talk, is it has to do with green spaces. We know from many studies that people who live in, in proximity to green spaces have lower risk of cardiovascular mortality. And that greenness has a protective um, effect against uh, cardiovascular disease. But most of these studies have been sort of associative. And we know that people who live in green spaces tend to have uh, much better, more privileged lives. They have better access to food. They have better access to walking spaces. They have higher socioeconomic status. So we need to figure out ways in which we want to tease the influence of green spaces apart from other covariates that might be uh, contributing to this link. But be that as may, we are exposed to green spaces in a variety of different uh, scenarios. In the natural environment, we are exposed to green spaces when we are in forests or grasslands and other areas. We are also exposed to green spaces in our own social environments, in uh, sort of yards and parks and trees around us, and also in our own uh, personal environments. So people have been living in close proximity to plants uh, in most civilized and cultured societies. We even like, like pets, we want to keep plants close to us. And therefore we think that there may be a relationship between our health and well-being and the greenness that surrounds us. One of the most stark examples of the effects of greenness on our health came from a study showing that when there was a loss of ash trees, and it's shown over here, um, this uh, loss of ash trees was because of infestation from the ash borer beetle, which in the Northern United States have actually culled down several million trees. And the, as the sort of epidemic spread from the North to the South, we could see that uh, the, the increase in the time for the ep of the epidemic or the infestation was accompanied by a corresponding increase in the rates of cardiovascular mortality. So the lesson that we can learn from this study is that in communities where trees die, people die as well. And so there is some unknown, unidentified and poorly understood relationship between the natural environment, particularly green environment in our surrounding and our own health and uh, well-being. The idea was further reinforced by a very large study. This is the nurses health study, over 100,000 nurses from the uh, Public Health Institute in Harvard, where they found that women, and these are nurses, women living in highest areas of greenness had a 12% lower mortality rate than women who were living in less green areas. So again, reinforcing and um, sort of bolstering the idea that greenness is a critical determinant of our health and disease risk. Then there are studies of the, from entire countries, and this is from the United Kingdom, uh, particularly the areas of England, where it was found that the rate of cardiovascular mortality in the least green areas was twice of that of the greenest areas. So people who live in the green areas uh, are likely to have less disease risk and have lead healthier lives than people who live in less green areas. And this uh, idea was further uh, reinforced by the study from Canada and a study of 101.3 million adults showing that people who live in more green areas, and this NDVI is a, is a measure of greenness. And so as you have more greenness, you have less 
hazard ratio, which is less um, probability of dying. So there is a, a sort of undeniably a, an association, whether this is just an association or a causal relationship, which means that whether there's a cause and effect relationship, we do not know as yet. In fact, our own work with cancer patients shows that, that people who have cancer and have a greater chance of surviving cancer if they live in green areas. And this is a study of at least 5 million cancer patients from uh, I think seven or nine different states around the United States over 16 years, uh, showing that if people are living uh, in green areas, and the greenness here is measured by NDVI, and I'll explain to you what that means. But here, just, just take it as an index of greenness, and then people are living in more green areas seem to have uh, less um, uh, cancer. And this seems to be um, sort of much, the effects to be much higher in sort of high survivable cancer, um, the, for example, breast cancer, than in low survivable cancer. And that would be like lung cancer or, or um, esophageal cancer. So if you have a, a highly survivable cancer, your chances of survival are increased if you live in uh, greener areas. We see a similar pattern with uh, cardiovascular disease, particularly stroke, and people who, who have had stroke. And if you follow their survival, you could see that people who are living in areas with higher NDVI, which is higher greenness, that would survive um, much at a much higher rate from stroke than people who are living in less green areas. So how does greenness have all these beneficial effects and what can we do to A, examine the causal relationship, if any, between greenness and health, and B, identify what the individual mechanisms may be that contribute to the protective effects of greenness on health. So there are many ideas that have been put forth. One of the ideas is that if you live in green spaces, you're likely to be more physically active because if you are in greener spaces, you are more likely to be outside, you're more likely to interact with nature. If you live in a place where there is no neighboring or surrounding green spaces. There is very little incentive to be out and to be in, oh, in the open. There's certainly very little incentive to be physically active. If there are no sidewalks, then people cannot walk. And, and I've heard this often in our cardiology prevention clinic, the cardiologists come and tell the patients, you know, you need to lose weight, you need to control your diabetes, and you need to walk and you need to run and you need to be doing all this physical activity. And then we, you know, and then we blame people for not being physically active. And then on the other hand, we make cities where we make it impossible for anyone to walk. And so we are sort of delivering contradictory messages and imposing contradictory strains on people, uh, which actually prevents them from being fully physically active and thereby decreasing the risk of disease. And maybe green spaces could do that could promote people from being physically active. There is also uh, some uh, evidence showing that if you live in greener spaces, you have greater social cohesion. You, if you're around green spaces, you tend to be outside, you would be tending to your garden, you'll talk to your neighbor, you will develop long-term relationship with people around you. Whereas if you live in an unsafe, ungreen area, where there are broken windows and drug rings and crime, you tend to stay boarded up into your house and you have fewer opportunities of interacting with other people. Then there's also the idea that green spaces improve your mental health. And there is in fact, a lot of work showing that people who live in green spaces have report less mental issues, less air sort of um, incidents of depression and anxiety, even lower rates of crime. Um, if we are interacting with nature, there's something about nature that e even when we attend to nature doesn't demand a cognitive energy. And so when people spend time in nature, they feel recharged and rejuvenated. 
And we can see from some studies that being in around nature can increase cognition and attention because uh, interacting with nature is effortless. There is a whole idea called the um, sort of a biogenic or sort of biophilia, which is to have this innate tendency of being in, in nature and our natural things. And when we are around natural things and in nature, that it, it is not a demanding activity. In fact, it is uh, it recharges the brain, improves cognition and focus. But there are other ideas. And one idea is that maybe being around nature can also improve our immunity. So when we evolved as humans, we were already ex always exposed to a lot of antigens. And we know now, uh, for example, with the coronavirus, that we have been, ex we are exposed to all sorts of microbes around us. And then if we have been around nature, then or around antigens that are uh, sort of, of plant origin, then we have a more educated, more learned immune system. So that would be able to protect us from unknown or newer threats. Um, there is a hypothesis called the old friends hypothesis. So we grew up with these microbes and we grew up with the uh, plant material and we have this innate immunity against these uh, sort of uh, ch immune challenges and living in ultra clean environments can actually be harmful, prevents us and our immune system from being educated. Uh, uh, sort of one clear example is uh, call, is with children and children who live in on farms in and play in the dirt and are out in the open are less likely to have asthma than children who live indoors in high rises and cities and urban environments and so forth. So therefore, their immune system doesn't actually get acclimatated or or educated to be able to deal with the natural world. For example, there is a high incidence of myopia in children in the United States. And part of that uh, uh, large increase could be because of lack of exposure to sunlight. During development, when children are exposed to sunlight, it educates their optic nerve and their uh, eyeballs to be to develop properly so that they would not become myopic as adults, leave alone being myopic as children. So children who are exposed to at least six hours of sunlight a day have low incidence of myopia children who are brought up in artificial light. So just by looking at green spaces reduces stress and makes us feel more at ease and less anxious and less worried. And so therefore um, there has been this whole school of thought thinking that maybe improving our nature around us, increasing green space around us would be of high benefit to our health both, uh, both mental health, psychological health, and physical health. So one such example is a study in which they actually had these people who had a major surgery, say a gallbladder removal or so on. And after surgery, they were then put in a hospital room, which either had a brick wall, a window facing a brick wall, or a window facing a pleasant garden. And what the investigators found that was people who were actually in a room facing a brick wall required more pain medication and on average one day longer for recovery to go home than people who were actually looking out at greener spaces. So just looking at green spaces uh, seemed to increase your threshold for pain and it promotes recovery from major trauma. Of course, uh, it also reduces mental stress and, and people have, um, you know, they've written books and um, sort of articles and essays of how the green spaces are restorative, that being in green spaces could people recover from PTSD, from major traumatic events. I know some, several groups they're working in working with veterans to see if uh, if they spend time in green spaces that the PTSD symptoms improve. There are people working with women who have been recently diagnosed with breast cancer and take them out on uh, nature hikes and so on. So to see if there was an improvement in which way they can deal with this um, adverse diagnosis 
and with this difficult period of time in, of their life, which they are going through. But in addition to all this sort of mental, slightly ungraspable benefits of nature, there may be some very real benefits. And one of the benefits that we could quantify much more readily is air pollution. We know that trees can remove air pollution, they can decrease the levels of particulate air pollution, they can actually improve um, uh, areas around uh, polluted uh, sites and so on. So that may be one other benefit. So putting it all together, it seems that there may be many different ways in which greenness could affect and improve our urban environments by decreasing air pollution and light pollution. They can increase, even decrease noise levels and improve the general livability, walkability and acceptability of a neighborhood. And so these, uh, what we would call beneficial, beneficial or salutary changes could then affect several physiological mediators by improving physical activity, decreasing exposure to pollution, decreasing stress, by decreasing night noise and light pollution, increase the quality of sleep, by improving immune resilience, by promoting and facilitating social cohesion, maybe there are beneficial effects on blood pressure, cholesterol and insulin resistance and so on. And that could lead to a decrease in the rates of heart disease. So that's kind of a view that maybe that's what's ha helping us do that. So therefore, uh, what we did was to look at the city of Louisville and see if there was uh, an effect on greenness of air pollution. For that, we measured greenness by what we call NDVI, where I've mentioned this before, when a tree is healthy, it sends up a, a green signal and we can measure this greenness from satellite imagery and that we could then calculate what the level of greenness in an area is. So what we did, we calculated uh, the greenness around a person's home uh, and, and then we saw whether or not that greenness would be associated with the exposure to toxic gases. And these are some of the toxic gases that we were interested in. For example, there is toluene, there's benzene, there's methanol, there's, um, there is also acrolein and so on. So all of these are called volatile organic compounds. And these are present in our environment from a variety of different sources from air pollutions, from fumigants, from plastics and paint and so on. And so we looked at the exposure of individuals, I think about 600 or so individuals around Louisville by measuring the metabolites of these uh, pollutants in the urine. And what we found overall that as we uh, move closer to the house with more greenness close to the house, there was a decrease in the urinary level of these metabolites. And so showing that people who live in green spaces are less likely to be exposed to such toxic chemicals. And in, if you live in an area which is less green, you're more likely to be exposed uh, from these chemicals which come from traffic and come from other areas, maybe super fun sites and um, you know, power plants could be you know, other industry in, in your area which could actually uh, lead to a variety of adverse outcomes. But if you live in more green areas, you are going to be somewhat shielded. So greenness could have very widespread effects on the health of a community. Uh, trees can shade buildings, and so you can have savings in uh, fuel cost. We have seen some studies, as I pointed out, could reduce the uh, risk of heart disease. Um, we can have people who are healthy, the trees can help by removing uh, air pollutants, particularly the particulate air pollution. And then we can improve the quality of the neighborhood. And so people could be, uh, there could be more walkability, livability, and social cohesion. So one of the pilot experiments we did to test this was uh, whether air pollution can Im improve um, air condition or air quality was uh, in a school here in Louisville. This called this the school is St. Margaret Mary. And as you can see, it, was, it is very close to a major roadway. There is no barrier between the roadway and the school. And so there's a lot of air pollution that goes from the school to, uh, to the roadway. And what we did was we planted a buffer between the school and the roadway. And so what we found was by planting this buffer, we could decrease the levels of air pollution. 
So we could see that there is an actual effect of greenness on air pollution, but what would that mean? I mean, uh, we, we've known a large number of studies showing that there is an association between greenness and health, but again, no causal um, evidence. So we, for, to, to gain further insights in the mechanism by which greenness affects our health, and to see if there is or is not a causal link, we launched this project called the Green Heart Project. Uh, it is a collaboration between a variety of different partners, particularly from the National Institute of Health, who, who uh, think or who are funding what we call the clinical study, which is like a clinical trial. We would, um, so they are funding the clinical study of that, of course, the University of Louisville. We have an active uh, collaboration with the Nature Conservancy. The NIH can only fund uh, sort of biological clinical work, but wouldn't fund, you know, get us money to buy trees and so on. So all of the greenery is being supported by the Nature Conservancy. All the air pollution work is done by people at WashU, the Department of Chemical Engineering, and we have partners from the city as well as from um, the U.S. Forest Services. Uh, the Hyphae Labs in uh, uh, Oakland, California, are designing all the greenness for us so that we could do this large, very complicated project. So the, the project is to test the hypothesis that exposure to greenery diminishes the risk of cardiovascular disease by decreasing the levels of air pollution in the neighborhood. So what will we do in order for us to test this hypothesis? So first we did is we actually identified a neighborhood with relatively less levels of greenness. You can see lots of houses here have low levels of greenness at the tree canopy in this area is about 12% or so. And so we could identify a neighborhood. There is a control neighborhood, which is a surrounding area, but then there's a target neighborhood. So what we want to do is to put greenness in the target neighborhood and then look at how does it change in, in relationship to a control neighborhood. So in order for us to do that, first we did some baseline evaluation we did a, a flyover over the neighborhood and we did hyperspectral imaging and LIDAR imaging of the area. And we could see that there are, what are the different tree species within the neighborhood, which trees are stressed. These red ones are hyper-stress, yellow ones are somewhat stressed. And so we could know which trees are stressed, particularly we are losing a lot of ash trees. So we can figure out what are the areas and opportunities for planting? What are the areas that have high levels of stress trees. And so we can then create a map of where all the trees are in the neighborhood and where there are opportunities to plant more trees so that we can significantly improve the green or elevate the level of greenness in the area. We then went and did uh, measurements of air pollution. And this is, these are mobile measurements. Um, the area is characterized by a beige of freeway running in between the area and the neighborhood. We have uh, what sort of mobile monitoring in which a graduate student goes out on a go-kart measuring the levels of air pollution. And then we also have fixed site monitoring. As you can see that areas around roadways are redder and that would mean that they have higher levels of air pollution. And we think that after this estimate, we will be much better equipped to then selectively plant trees around these areas where, have, where there are large areas of air pollution to be able to maximize our uh, intervention, the efficacy of intervention. And then we did a cardiovascular exam. We, we did one in 2019, but then COVID intervened. And so we had to repeat it again. So we're repeating it again this year. Uh, we have over 700 people who are enrolled in the study. We do an in-person exam. We measure blood pressure, lipids, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease risk, and biomarkers of cardiovascular injury to get a very comprehensive evaluation of the cardiovascular disease risk. We then uh, do a psychosocial evaluation um, by uh, looking at the levels of anxiety and depression, uh, as well as looking at the social interaction and cohesion. We measure air pollution levels by satellites as well. And then we measure greenness, measuring NDVI levels by, um, by NASA launch satellites so that we can get a comprehensive view of the levels of greenness and air pollution in the area. We, like I said, we also measure uh, uh, local levels of air pollution by do, doing fixed site monitoring. And we go to this utility poles to, to mount our air pollution monitors to be able to 
get an idea of the level of air pollution in the areas in a micro uh, heterogeneous level. We do an exam of the natural environment that the neighborhood is in and surrounding the freeway. Where are the trees? Where are the parks? And so on, so that we know every bush and tree in the neighborhood. And after this baseline exam, we want to actually uh, go back and plant trees. And since if you plant a small tree, it's going to take a lot of time, maybe 20, 30 years, we want to plant large trees. And these trees are between uh, 10 to 40 feet high. And we want to plant 10,000 of these trees. And so it is not a trivial expense. It's going to cost us over eight to $10 million to plant these 10,000 trees. We have to go to these neighbors door to door, asking them, can we please plant trees in your front yard or the backyard? We have to talk to the city to plant trees in the right away. We have to talk to the park authorities. And we're still in the process of doing that, but we are actually doing, uh, trying to uh, increase the overall greenness of the area. And this sort of activity has attracted a lot of attention. And if you're interested, I can point you towards you know, a whole 10 minute coverage by the PBS about our green heart experiment. Then you want to plant trees next to the roadway. And uh, if some people believe that, oh, trees are good, we just plant it, it'll work. But if you plant trees in a wrong configuration and they're haphazardly planted, then you can see that even, so if this is a current condition, where this is the no trees area, the black line. So if you then plant it in this current condition, you can see that you may actually can make things worse because these trees just trap the air pollutants and then uh, sort of make the pollution levels at nose level even worse. But if you design the, this buffer carefully, you can create a sort of a gradient or incline for dissipation of the pollutants properly. So then you could design these roadside buffers, you can do neighborhood planting uh, in areas where there is high levels of traffic so that you can plant both canopy trees, and evergreens, we are all biased toward more evergreens because evergreens have give you twice the greenness because they are there for the entire year. Uh, we did computational analysis in being able to understand how the, the pollutants, dissipation of the pollutants would, would be affected upon our different configurations of our planting. The idea is to gently remove air pollutants from by putting these buffers from uh, neighborhoods and thereby decrease exposure uh, to people living in this neighborhood. Then after we've done that, after four years, we want to go back and see whether there are any changes in the physical health of the people, their mental well-being, the social interactions, has the environment in the neighborhood improved? Do we get more, um, um, more benefits by putting green trees near the roadways or in the neighborhood? And does that translate into a reduction in the levels of air pollution in the area. So overall, I think what we will learn from this is how trees affect health. I mean, uh, there is a lot of evidence already supporting the case and people in the neighborhood we talk to say, well, we, given trees are good for you, but we do not know how and why and to what extent and which trees and where should they be placed. And, and so to what level trees are affected in removing pollutants from the air, which tree species work better, what age, height, you know, tree density would be the most appropriate. Um, how are the different, is, are the effects of uh, greenness in a neighborhood due to changes in immune levels or greater physical activity or lower blood pressure or anxiety or cognition? So we need to tease all of these things out because that's important for us to be able to then develop a blueprint or so, if you will, a green print to be able to identify and then recommend what are the beneficial effects of trees, not only just the health, but in the uh, sort of the health of the community in terms of crime rates and property values, stormwater runoff, energy use, the heat island effect, and variety of other sources. In fact, we had a group of people who are trying to understand how putting this greenness would, would affect biodiversity in an urban environment. They're measuring bats and butterflies and uh, arthropod species in the area and for the baseline evaluation. And then we will see what happens once we plant all these trees. So we believe uh, that our work would have a global impact uh, in uh, potentially identifying new ways to prevent heart disease, which regardless of whatever we are trying to do, uh, keeps 
uh, increasing relentlessly and has been and will seems to be continue to be a major killer of human populations. We will find a new ways of decreasing air pollution. Maybe we even find new ways of um, combating climate change by changing the heat island effects, by uh, sequestering carbon and other um, vicious and toxic gases. And once we know all these, de all these things in detail, we might just might be able to develop new urban policies and guidelines and building codes that could become a model for understanding how we live in urban environments and how can we create environments that are uh, healthier. And so once we have this model that could be replicated worldwide. And so, but overall, it would sort of uh, reinforce the idea and support the notion that our health is critically dependent upon, upon our environments. So I'm going to sort of stop here and then take any uh, questions that you might have um, and happy to discuss further. Well, thank you, Dr. Bhatnagar. I learn something new from you every time I hear you speak and we really appreciate you sharing all this with us. Um, if anybody has any questions, please um, put them in the Q&A now. I had um, two questions for you. One was um, about speaking with the community about this project and how you um, reached out to the community, educated them, what kind of reactions you got. Um, and the second was that, wow, this is a lot to coordinate. So I'm just curious for those of us who might want to um, think about um, projects, maybe not this ambitious on a little smaller scale, but still engaging different groups and keeping everybody uh, moving towards the same objective. Right, so let me address your first question. So when we want to do something in the community, we cannot go to some people and impose our values and our ideas on them. You should have a green neighbor. That's not the point. So we went to the community and say, what are your priorities? And what is your neighborhood plan? So one of the things they had in the plan was to have a greener neighborhood. So we said, okay, so this is your plan. And the communities that did not have that in their radar, we didn't want to go with them, right? It said, we don't want to go to a community and say we want to enforce ideas. So, so then they did um, say that greenness was a priority for them. And so we worked with them. We did uh, three or four focus groups of people. And, and then we asked them if they would be able to, you know, tell us what they think if we put greenness there and so on. So, so we got a lot of feedback in focus groups. Then uh, we went to people and, you know, like a town hall sort of meeting and talked to our people and said, if you're going to do this in your neighborhood, would you be okay? Would you know be all right? And we did that. Then we went door to door telling people, would you we knock on the door and say, we're going to do this. Would you like to put a plant in your yard? And some people said, great. And some people said, well, you are a bunch of, you know, idiots and just get out of my yard. And, you know, I mean, you know, there are people of all sorts in the world. And so that we didn't conform to their expectations. I you know we worried about crime. We were worried about with the poverty and you know you people are you know fancy people worried about your trees so we try to convey to them no this is important it makes a difference to your life and so on so we got a really very wide buy-in and we still have a community advisory group the community members attend all our meetings we interact with them on a on a, on a weekly and monthly basis we send out a newsletter to everybody every month of what we are doing uh, so we have already, uh, you know, seven, eight hundred houses that we agreed to, you know, for us to put plants there. Each house, some people want like eight or ten, you know, big trees in their house, and we're trying to meet all those demands. So that's one one way of, of thing. The, the biggest problem was to have a control area, and then we go to those people and say, you participate in the study, you want to test you, poke you, take your blood, and your, but we won't give you trees. Right, so people were not very happy about that. So we, we said, well, we did it like a clinical trial. In a clinical trial, you, you conduct what's called something like intent to treat. So we said, look, we only have limited amount of money and we can do the central area first. And if we have more money, we'll do the ones later. So if we, in the next round, we'll green the control areas and the areas surrounding to that area will be the control. So we just keep on spreading like that, right? So we don't want people to be alienated or insulted that we didn't put trees when they participated in the study. The second question is about how to organize. It's very difficult. There are people of different disciplines and people with different ideas. And I would say people with different languages. It's very difficult to talk to a arborist and tell them that you have to get me 
the GIS coordinate of every tree that you plant and that you have to give me this report, written report. They just say, oh, this is great. I like the soil. And they you know, poke around, they smell it or whatever they do. They say, yeah, this tree goes here. And ask them, why did you put this tree here? They say, oh, 30 years of experience, right? So, <laughs> so we, can't, we can't certainly be sort of um, held to that. So, so we said, well, it's, it's experience, but we should write it down. So the, to get everybody to create a scientific infrastructure to be able to account, it was very, very difficult. And, and that's why we're still struggling with that. But we have a very good team. We have um, a retired colonel from the army and he's an operations manager. And then he's coordinating everything and make sure that we all, everybody falls in line. But the biggest challenge has been to coordinate and to get all of the same. You have, we have trucks coming in with trees from like eight different states. And, you know, they come in all these big trailers and, and they have to be a sort of triage area with staging area where they're unloaded and they have to be put in the ground with the space and all this. So it needs a lot of coordination. Wow. Um, okay, we have a question. Uh, what are some best practices for working with municipalities? Also examples of municipalities that understand and are taking action. So it is difficult to convey to the municipalities what we actually want to do. Of course, they're very eager to green areas, but they want to plant small little things that'll take like 30 years to grow and they won't let us plant trees and right, trees and right of ways because they want to, don't want to obstruct any vision, line of vision and so on. And they want to put everything in the park and then leave everything empty. They're not worried about people's homes and so on. So they're only worried about public spaces. But we have found our people here in Metro Louisville to be very enlightened and very helpful and, and accommodating and forthcoming to be able to do, allow us to do that and to be able to talk to them what we're doing. We've been spent two years trying to convince them that this is useful and important and that we want to do that. One way of addressing them, the, the issue to them, which they, they readily understand and agree with is that this is uh, an exercise in reducing disparities. We look at Louisville and the richer parts of all the greenness and the poorer parts have no trees. So, you know, come on, I mean, it's obvious that we need to do something about it and the mayor and everybody else understands that and wants to make that as a, you know, as a talking point and issue. So that was one of the selling points. Examples, many people have been very fascinated with this idea. We've had, um, I've had discussions with the mayors of like Milan and, and uh, Sydney and, uh, and uh, Madrid and Melbourne and, and, and uh, Sao Paulo and all these people want to do the greenery in that area and put that put trees in the city and figure out how and where to put the trees. Very few people so far, there have been none, uh, have the resources to actually do something so extensive. So they said, why don't you do this? And then tell us what the best way to do. In the meantime, we're there planting trees everywhere. We want to put this issue in the, um, you know, in the WHO as well as in the UN, so that when we have this issue, this in the world community, that not only in the United States, but developing countries as well, could develop these ideas and implement some of these best practices that we hope that we would be able to develop. Thank you. And when do you think you'll have some preliminary results to share with all of us? So we would have had something at this time, but we are about a year and a half or two behind because of COVID. We did, uh, we were going to plant everything in 2020, but we couldn't. We are starting this fall. So we are planting nonstop from, uh, I think it will be October to next May. And so in 2022, uh, we'll begin collecting data. So by 2023, we should have some uh, preliminary data of what is happening with our community. Great, one more question. To your knowledge, have any pediatricians in Louisville embraced the kind of nature RX concept to literally prescribe time in nature for their patients to promote mental and physical health? So the, so the, yes, so we're working with several pediatricians. They are, they want to do like an asthma study. The, the, they are a little bit wary of green spaces because if they have these kids with asthma and allergies and they go out and they get more severe problems, the asthma exacerbates and they have, uh, you know, breathing issues and so on. So they are, they really do not know. And so they have not sort of warmed up to the idea sort of uncritically that, oh, we should go spend time in nature all the time, right? And so we are in the process of doing that is that there are ways of interacting with nature which are not particularly harmful and there are 
ways in which that we can interact, which, you know, at some seasons and so on, where they, it would not be a, an issue. One of the things that we are doing with the green nest is we are not planting, and, and we have been yelled at for doing this, not planting any male trees. So this is a sort of a sex discrimination among trees. And so we want to, we'll, we'll plant some, but very, very few male trees. We don't want a huge rise in pollen. We have several pollen monitors in the area and that's so that we want to make sure that we don't worsen the problem uh, of allergies and asthma, particularly we are in a valley and everything seems to just stay here in Louisville high. We have high levels of allergy and asthma in our community. Well, Dr. Bhatnagar, I want to be respectful of your time. So thank you again so much on behalf of all of us. And we will be looking forward to hearing the results of your study and best of luck with it. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to talk to you and pleasure to answer all these questions. And good luck with your endeavors. I'm sure you, that you will succeed in, in you know, making New Jersey a garden state, right? So make it more, more green than it actually is. Absolutely. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.